for, for some of you that have been coming here for a very, very long time, a little bit of what I'm going to share with you today might be repetitive for you. But I ask that you just bear with me because, as you know, we have a lot of new folks coming to the church. And today I want to take some time to just really share with you the conception of how Second Chance Church came to be and what we are doing now and where we are going as the Holy Spirit guides and directs and leads us. Amen? So a portion of what you'll hear today, if you're an old timer, and I don't mean that by your age, I mean that by if you've been here for a while, some of this you've heard before, just bear with me, just smile and grin, don't sit there and say, dude, I've heard this a million times, all right? Just follow with me, we're going to get through this. I want to I, I want to say something, okay, because in sharing how the conception of Second Chance came about, I have to share a b little bit about myself, but I want you to know something. This is not about me. It has never been about me, nor will it ever be about me. It will always, always be about our King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do you understand where we're coming from this morning? No one but King Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit is worthy so this morning, as I share a little bit about my history, I want you to understand it's only to bring us to where we are today. I don't want anybody to think for a minute that I believe that anything is about myself. Fair enough? All right, so I want to start this morning from what I have in my notes that is labeled the beginning, okay? Last month, in the month of January, I celebrated my spiritual birthday, if you are a born-again Christian, you actually have two birthdays. Amen? Do you remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus and Jesus told him, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven? And Nicodemus was confused. He said, how can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time? And Jesus was talking about being born in the Spirit. All right, so I have two birthdays. I have a physical birthday where I came into this world, and I have a spiritual birthday, and that spiritual birthday is January 28th, 1987, and last month on the, on the, on the, the, the 28th day of the month, I celebrated 36 years in Christ Jesus. As a 13-year-old kid, I can remember uh, starting to go to a youth group and um, I had recently moved to the state of Florida. I had been living in Virginia with my mother, and my mother had sent me and my brother to live with our father in the state of Florida. And I look back on this now, and I, I see how God had ordained every step. You know, God has your life in his hands. Every step that you go through, he is guiding you and leading you, even when we don't see it. And I can remember moving to Florida, and for the first time in my life, living with my dad. My parents were divorced when I was a very young uh, child. And moving to Florida, everything was new, new school, new home life, new everything. And I, I was really just trying to find my way as a, well, I was actually 12 when I moved, but I was just trying to find my way, and I got an invitation to a youth group on a Wednesday night, and they had this huge gymnasium, and, and they played basketball every Wednesday night after church, and I just loved playing basketball back then. I know you can't tell by looking at me now, but um, I, I solely went just to play basketball, really. I'm, I'm just being transparent. I went to play basketball, and I went because there were some pretty girls that, that went there at the time. <clears throat> None prettier than my wife sitting here this morning, right? Amen. All right. All right, got to throw that in there, right? Boom, boom. All right. So, um, but on this particular night, January 28th, 1987, as the young people filled into this room, and my youth pastor, Jim Hall, who is like a spiritual father to me. He's nowhere near old enough to be my father, but he was a spiritual father to me, and to, still to this day, he, he pours into me. Uh, he preached a salvation message and gave an invitation to the altar. And for the first time in my life, I heard the voice of God speak to me and he said, I have chosen you. I have called you. 
if you'll give my life to me, I'll use you. And I went down to that altar that night and I accepted the Lord Jesus as a 13-year-old kid, didn't know nothing about the Bible, didn't know nothing about God, didn't know anything about what my future held. All I knew is that for the first time in my life, I heard the voice of God and he said that he wanted me and he had called me and I said, Lord, I'm yours, whatever you want to do. And, and I said that prayer, I, my youth pastor gave me a Bible. He wrote in it, saved January 28th, 1987. I still have that Bible to this day. And every once in a while, I break it out and I remind the devil who I am in Christ Jesus. And I remind him the day that, he, that Jesus Christ plucked me out of the world, not because I'm perfect, not because I'm good, but because of what he did. Amen? It wasn't too too long after that, uh, that I started to feel as I was growing in my relationship with God and growing in the Word, I remember the Lord speaking to me and the, for, the, for the first time knowing about that He had called me into ministry. And I remember having a conversation with my youth pastor at his house, talking to him. I said, I, I, I need to talk to you. And I went to his house and, and um, it was, you know, we, we sat down and I said, Pastor Jim, I believe that God has called me into the ministry. And I mean, the biggest smile came over his face. He threw his arms around me. And and, and from that day, even all through the years, he has coached me, mentored me, and poured into me spiritually. And so uh, I always felt like that God had called me into youth ministry. From the very beginning, I felt like that God had called me into youth ministry, and from the very beginning, I never, ever felt like God had called me to pastor a church, ever. In fact, I remember telling Pastor Jim that. I said, uh, I am going to go into youth ministry, and I'm going to do youth ministry as long as the Lord wants me to, and then I'll I'll move, I'll do something else because God has not called me to pastor a church, and I just want to tell you that I spent 12 years in full-time student ministry and just saw some of the most amazing young people that God brought into our lives uh, that to this very day we still have strong relationships with, traveled the world with them on missions trips, seen God perform miracles, all kind of things. And those were some of the best years in ministry in our lives going through uh, youth ministry. And again, I always said that I never felt like that God had called me to pastor. And I started getting to a point where all of the guys that I saw start out at, in youth ministry with me were going on to be pastors of churches. And I was like, well, you know, I don't know that I can retire as a youth pastor. And uh, I felt like that uh, God was transitioning me, and that is when I began to go into law enforcement. And so I entered into law enforcement in the year 2006 and uh, did youth ministry from 1994 to 2006, transferred into law enforcement and still as a Christian, still believing and following God, and uh, still saying, God, I'm yours, but you know, now I'm moving into a new profession. And, uh, and so I remember sitting in front of a, a command staff asking me questions. You know, well, all you've ever done is ministry in your life. What do you, how do you think that you could do this position in law enforcement? You know, you know there's people that are going to say some, some cuss words every now and then when, in law enforcement. I'm like, really? Are you serious? I didn't know that people talked like that. It's amazing how people in the world look at you. <laughs> but... Um, so I began a career in law enforcement, still following the Lord, and um, approximately somewhere, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of progressing, bringing us into how Second Chance came about, but somewhere around 2013, um, I felt in my spirit that God had, um, was asking us to start a church in Gainesville, Florida, and um, I began to seek the Lord over it. Uh, I remember um, committing to God to do this. I remember at the time, and this is just a figure of speech, ladies and gentlemen, but I slid all of my chips into the table and I said, God, uh, whatever it takes, I'm going to do this. I remember driving to Gainesville one day to scout out um, 
and pray where God would have us start the church. And driving uh, up there, I felt the Holy Spirit say that this church was called Freedom Community Church. And we began to move forward. Um, at some point in time, I quit my job in law enforcement, drew money out of my retirement, lived off of that, and started putting money towards the launch of this church. We had a launch day set. We had plans set. And to make a long story short, we just struggled and struggled, struggled to find a facility. And we had been promoting this for almost uh, 10 months. And uh, we had a launch date. You could go to our website. There was a countdown to our launch. I mean, everything. We were all in on this. But the short, the long, uh, make a long story short, we actually never launched. Um, and I was confused. I was bitter. I was angry. I, I are we allowed to be transparent? I was angry because I knew that God had told me this is what he wanted me to do, and we stepped out in faith, and we did it, but the result was not what we were looking for. Now, you've heard me say this many, many times. Obedience is up to you and I. The result is up to God. And we cannot allow the result of our obedience to dictate how we respond to God. But in this circumstance, I did. I was mad. I was angry. I was like, God, you, you left us high and dry. There was, a, there, was a, there was embarrassment involved because this had been promoted social media for months and months and months. I was frustrated. I was frustrated that I had left my job. I had frustrated that I took money out of retirement. I was frustrated about the whole thing. And internally, I had said to myself, Lord, listen. Let, no, I, no, listen to what I'm saying. I said, Lord, I'm embarrassed to verbalize this this morning, but I'm just being honest. I said, Lord, you got me this time, but you ain't getting me again. That's transparency. You got me, but you ain't getting me again. You hear what I'm saying? But I want to remind you this morning that obedience is better than sacrifice. And when you step out in obedience, then the result of the obedience is not up to us. Many times when we step out in obedience, we have this grandiose idea of what the result is going to look like. But the result is not up to us, it's up to God. And I can remember arguing with God. None of y'all have ever done that, I'm sure. But in my arguing with God about my obedience and his failure to give me the result that I was looking for, God intervened and said, I am God, and when I come to you, and speak to you, if I come to you a hundred times and tell you to do something, and all hundred times you step out and you obey me, and the result is not what you are looking for, when I come to you at a hundred and one, you are still to obey me because I am God. You obey me because I am God. You don't obey me because of the result. That was the old woodshed whooping in the spirit realm. So I went back to work at the sheriff's office, which was a very humbling experience. Lost all my seniority, so I was, I was patrolling Marion Oaks at midnight, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. by my yelf, as my youngest son used to say. And um, so there was still frustration going on. And in March of 2015, I'm going somewhere with this, so just follow me. In March of 2015, the Lord encountered me um, in a series of dreams. God has always spoke to me through dreams. 
I, I had a, I'm not going to go through all the dreams in detail, but the Lord gave me a dream the very next day. The, the dream that I had, which was very detailed, came to pass. And I knew that God was trying to speak to me through my dreams. And after several nights of having dreams, I had another dream. And in this dream, I was standing inside of a church. I was not teaching I was not preaching, but I was standing on the stage of this church. As it, it was as if the Lord was allowing me to view the people as he was encountering them. I was standing on a stage similar to this, and I was watching the Holy Spirit fall on God's people as they worshiped him, and he was encountering them supernaturally. And I was just watching this take place. I was watching God minister to his people, encountering them supernatural, healing people, delivering people, people worshiping them with God, just, just complete worship, just giving God their all. And I remember in this dream very vividly that the, that the church was called Second Chance Church. I remember the authenticity of the worship. I remembered the authenticity of God moving on his people. And I remember the name of the church was Second Chance Church. And I woke up from that dream and the Holy Spirit said to me, you are going to pastor this church. And I said, no, I am not. Brushed the dream off, went about my business. Did not tell my wife about the dream. And for 10 months, I rebelled against God because every time I would go into a time of prayer and I would begin to seek God, he would bring this dream back to my memory and say, what are you going to do? about this and I would stop praying and I would say I'm not going to do anything about this this went on for 10 months one night as I was up in the middle of the night I was not working that night but because my body was used to being up all night long I would, everybody in my house was asleep I, it was probably around 2 o'clock in the morning. I had some headphones on, and I was listening to some worship music. And a live version of the song Overwhelmed by Big Daddy Weave came on, and I was listening to it. If you're not familiar with Big Daddy Weave, it's, it's a Christian group. But he actually used to be, years ago, he used to be a worship pastor. Uh, and then they started their, their own group called Big Daddy Weave, and this song, Overwhelmed, just talks about how, he, how we are overwhelmed by the awesomeness of God. And as I was listening to this song, and I was listening about how we are overwhelmed at how awesome God is, how beautiful He is, how amazing He is, God encountered me, and He changed my thinking, and He changed my rebellion, and I fell on the face, on my face before the Lord, and I repented to God. I repented for my rebellion. I repented for my bitterness. I repented for my anger. I repented for everything. And I just remember saying to God after I repented, I said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this, talking about Second Chance Church. I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know when you're going to do it. I don't know where it's going to be. All I'm telling you is I will give you my yes. The rest is up to you. And from that moment, there was a, there was a shifting in my life spiritually. 
And when I gave God my yes, he began to start downloading revelation to me in the spirit realm of where the church would be. He began to start downloading vision to me about the church. He began to start sharing with me uh, what he wanted done. And so I remember going to my wife and telling her this story of the dreams. I remember telling her, look, I don't know. How, how this is going to happen, you got to remember, folks, we're fresh off of a failed church launch. We're fresh off of putting everything we had into a church launch that never even opened its doors. And we had committed to ourselves that we would do it, but we, we, we felt like that we were not supposed to talk about it and just continue to seek God's face. And that's what we did. I can remember praying, uh, asking God for favor, for resources, all of these things. And, um, and we just began to pray and seek God. And God just began to move. God began to bring people back into our lives that, ha- we, that we had been disconnected from just because of life. Not anything different. But long story short, I, I, as I began to start praying, I knew that God was calling us to the Bellevue area. And... Um, I had been looking online for months and months and months for a building, and um, at the time, Tim and I were, were looking together. Where's Tim? He's sitting over here. We'd been looking for buildings for this church launch because I'd, I'd come to a point where I'd shared with him about the vision of the church, and, and um, I had seen this building online for sale for months, and I didn't like it. And I thought it was too small. And we had gone and we had drove around and we had looked at some other buildings. And Tim and I were meeting for lunch one day. And I knew in my spirit the Lord was telling me, don't worry about the building being small because where you will start is not where you will finish. Just start and open the doors. And Tim and I had met at Longhorn that day, which is our favorite place to meet. And I said, this was, this was completely unannounced. Just, hey, I've, I, I, I've been looking at this building online. I've seen it a hundred times, but I really feel like God is saying that, that we need to hurry up and get this thing going. And so I said, I'm going to go down there this afternoon and look at it, this building right here. And he says, well, I'll go with you. So we drove down here unannounced, didn't know if it was open, unlocked, if there was be anybody in here. And I just want to tell you, when we pulled, you could not see this building from the road. What you see here now is completely different. We couldn't see, there was trees and bushes and everything. And we came in here, and to our surprise, we pulled on the door and we opened the door. And this, and it, the, the, it was one big long room. This wall didn't exist, all that out there didn't exist. Stage, the closet didn't exist. And it was a group of old people in here and they were square dancing and they had this big banner on the wall that said the dancing shadows and I remember this guy looked at Tim and said are y'all here to dance and I, before I can speak up Tim says the only dancing I do is in the spirit and we ain't here to dance We did not come here together to dance. (laughs) Can I get an amen? (laughs) We looked at this building, uh, and I I believe it was probably within a week there was a contract on this building. God opened the door for us. This building was purchased um, in 2016. In December of 2016, a small group of of just a few families started worshiping together in houses, moving from house to house to house. Uh, I remember in 2017, and some of y'all are here, while this building was under construction, we had an outdoor Easter service under these two big oak trees out here. We had lawn chairs everywhere, man, and we just had a worship service there. And February 25th, 2018, we had moved into this building. That's right. This month, on the 25th of this month, we will be five years old, this church, five years old. And all of the glory belongs to God. From the very beginning, God 
has given me vision for what he wants this church to be, what he wants this church to look like, what he wants this church to do. You've heard me say many, many times that God that we are an end times remnant church. We are in the last days. We are fighting against demons and devils. We are fighting against a woke culture, a woke mob. We are living in the last days. We are living in days where the church, uh, many churches have become neutered, have become spineless, that are not preaching truth, and they have folded to the doctrine of the day. And God has always called Second Chance to be an end times remnant church, allowing the Holy Spirit to move. We have never advertised an end time for our service, and we never will. And God gave us vision to start this church with the future of the three-phase plan that you guys have heard me teach on many times. We will eventually buy property, step one. Step two, Start our community agriculture farm. You guys have heard me talk about this from the beginning. God had told us to buy land, to grow fruits and vegetables, to feed people in the church, to feed the community, to raise livestock and chickens and all these things, grow a full-fledged community agriculture farm for the days that are coming. So we have physical resource to meet people's needs that will open the door up to the spiritual. That was step two, to begin the farm. Step three was to build a ministry center, not a church, a ministry center that would literally function 24-7. We have so many ministries that God has birthed out of Second Chance Church. There's ministry going on here throughout the week that you may not even know about. We have deliverance ministry going on weekly throughout the week. We have homeless ministry going out many times through the month. We have groups of people going to laundromats and paying for laundry and, p and praying for people. We have people going out on the streets cooking up hamburgers and feeding homeless people and pouring into them and praying for them. We have community events here where we give away free food and, and resources and, and have prayer tents. We have always been doing what God has called us to do, waiting for God to open up the, the, the door for us to move to wherever he wants us. Now, all that brought us to this. You ready? Last Sunday, I said, if you, if you see Second Chance as your church, I want you to be here next week. Because I had some things I wanted to share. But little did I know that God was going to do something amazing in a very short amount of time. I went home last Sunday night, and I did what I do on a regular basis. I pulled up a, full, a few realtor listings, and I just typed in land for sale in Bellevue. I've done this hundreds of times. You know, it's, it's kind of like when you go to your refrigerator and you open the door to look in it, looking for something. You don't find what you want, and you shut it, and you walk away, and 15 minutes later, you go back, and you open it up, and you're looking at it again, looking for something that maybe was you didn't see the first time. That's what I was doing as I was looking for land, and I came across this piece of property that caught my eye, and I, and, and I noticed that it had been listed on the market for over 320 days, and I had never, ever seen this property before. It sparked my interest. I called one of our elders. We began to do some research and some background on this property. The next day on Monday, I called a, a realtor and I said, can you see if we can go look at this property today? I called the elders and I said, can you guys meet at the church? At 2.30, we're going to go look at some property. They didn't even know, well, one of them did, but didn't even know what property it was, how much it was, anything. Just show up at the church, we're going to go look at some property. We drove to this property, and we all just were like, felt this peace come over us, that this was the property that the church was supposed to pursue. 
I want to share with you how God works. Because when God is in something, he, he brings it to pass. Amen? So I'm going to give you a little bit of hint about this property as we did our research. It, it was two parcels of property. One that's 15 acres, one that's 16 acres for 31 acres. As we researched it, we found out that this property was deeded to two sisters, one that lives in Oklahoma, one that lives in Texas. And um, I have literally drove past this property at least a hundred times and never even noticed it. How, I have no idea. So we went and we looked at it. The listing was saying that they were, would only consider selling both of the lots. And we were like, well, we're not sure that the church can afford both of the lots. And so we called our realtor and said, would you call the listing realtor and just say, um, are you interested in just selling one of the lots? Well, they said, no, we're not. And... So as we begin to pray about this and seek the Lord, I'm going to share with you and then I'm going to show you some pictures that the church decided to put an offer on one lot and one of our church members decided to put an offer on this other lot with the, with, with the intention of purchasing that lot so the church could get the other lot and also use the 16-acre lot for agriculture, and we submitted an offer on Thursday for this property, and on Friday night, with no counters of any kind, the sellers signed the contract, and we are under contract right now. The church having 15 acres and another 16-acre parcel right next to us. Y'all ain't even heard the best part yet, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> it is literally less than a mile from us, from where we sit right now. I mean, I couldn't, but someone could probably in two shots with a golf ball hit the property from here. Not me. Your husband could, Katie, but I, I couldn't do it. It's right up the street on 484, like you're going towards the Wawa. And I'm going to show you some pictures this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and we're going to keep moving, all right? What you're looking at here is just a plat map of this property, okay? Can everybody see this all right where you're sitting? Um, I'm just going to give you, I'm going to go over here to the side. Wish I had one of those little pointy things, okay? This right here is 484. As you're heading towards Wawa, going up to the corner of 484 and 441. If you were coming this way, you'd be heading straight down 44 coming towards us, Okay. So both of these lots, this is the, this is the 15 acre lot, this is the 16 acre lot. Both of these lots have frontage all along the highway. The reason why I've really never seen it before is because that highway is lined with thick trees all across the front. And unless you're really, really looking, you would never even see it, okay? So there's actually also an old road back here on the back end of the property that you could get to, coming close from around where Pat and Yolanda live, that you could enter the property from the back side. <clears throat> I want to tell you, as, as we're looking at some pictures, I, I went out there this week uh, and I started taking some pictures. This is a view from standing at the gate of the property, this is looking straight forward at the 15-acre piece that the church is under contract to buy, where the ministry center will be 
will be placed. This is standing right at the front. If you would turn and look to the left, that is going towards the second 16-acre front portion of the lot. And then I just began to take several pictures. Greg, we can move through these. Um, a lot of wide open property. Um, stop right here. Uh, go back just one. Can we go back one? On the back end of the property, there's some very nice, you can see some very nice, big, huge oak trees that um, would make a phenomenal place to do some prayer walks and, and, and different things like that. Um, keep going. Um, so you can see um, all of this. Several things about the property that we really liked is the entire outline of the property um, is treed. Kind of gives you kind of a, you know, a little bit of, you know, not that we're looking for privacy, but, you know. So um, there is a portion back here that I'm going to point out to you. Back here, which is an old pond, which we have discussed, clearing that out, digging it deeper, putting some clay line there, and creating a large two and a half, three acre pond possibly back there for water for livestock, fish, things of that nature. I want to tell you guys that we have been looking for land for a long time. We were actually at one point had a contract on a piece of land and there was an amendment that had to be done to it. It was, a, it was already, we had already agreed on a price, everything. And we had an amendment that had to be signed. And during that time, another buyer came and offered more money. And that property was, was no longer available. But I want to tell you that in, in, in five days, five days, we saw this property and are now under contract and have to our availability 31 acres of property to immediately begin our community farming. I want to share with you a couple of things. Are you guys all good? Y'all still with me? All right. We have a due diligence, due diligence period in the clause. The, the, the land is zoned agriculture we have to go before the city council of Bellevue to ask them for permission uh, to build a ministry center on this and to keep it agriculture. We're going to be putting together a presentation for the city to let them know the types of ministries that we are currently doing already. Uh, this is in the Bellevue city limits, and we're going to be telling them and talking to them about the types of ministries that we're going to be doing to minister to the people and the residents of the city of Bellevue and beyond, okay? I do not foresee that being a problem at all because I think that, that the city would be crazy to say, no, we don't want you helping people in our city, okay? Um, as soon as we get the go-ahead for that, we are going to immediately begin uh, working on the property. Now, I want you to understand some things. This property will give us the ability to start the agriculture phase two portion to where we can start raising animals and livestock and growing fruits and vegetables. We have several people in our church already that have a lot of experience in this in agriculture, animal science, all this stuff. God has been bringing these people in. Um, we are going to be doing regular community events out on the property even as we're before we even get moved out there. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing family events out there. We'll be doing all kinds of stuff out there. We'll be doing ministry events out there. But this is our, our plan moving forward. As soon as we close, we'll immediately begin the farm. We'll probably put out a huge sign out there, future home of community or uh, Second Chance Church. Worship with us now down the street. Uh, and w we will immediately just start working on this property. And we will immediately start having events out there. We'll, we'll be able to use it, and we are going to be putting together um, some committees with the elders and their wives and the staff and, and ministry leaders, and we are going to start looking into doing, uh, looking at church design for building a building out there. Um, I, think, I think Greg might even, we, we've already started looking. 
the, let me just say this is not the you know this is not what we've designed. We just have seen some other churches in the county with some um, metal siding type um, buildings that. So we're looking at different plans. Again, this is not what we're going to build. These are just showing you a couple pictures here. Um, but we are going to design a ministry center that will be large enough to facilitate all of our ministries and future ministries that God is going to be bringing. Um, and I want to say that I've never, ever, ever been more excited about what God is doing at Second Chance than I am right now. Uh, God is showing himself mighty. And God is saying, when I give you vision, I will bring you resources to carry out that. Now, we've been talking about this from day one. But we are ready to, as my old pastor used to say, to pull the trigger. We are moving forward. And I want you to know that we need everyone that is a part of this church to be a part of this vision. You may not teach, you may not sing, you may not stand on a stage, but you can love somebody, you can pull weeds, you could feed cows, you can show up with a smile on your face, you can harvest food, and you can pass out food, and you can pray with people, and you can share with people what God has done in your life. <clears throat> We are going to start shooting videos out on the property that are going to, is going to go on our new church website. Um, showing vision for how we're going to be using the community. Well, isn't it going to be awesome for people to see what's coming there and say, yo, i got to go check this out, and then they start showing up here and God changing their lives and, and moving in their lives. And um, I just want everybody to start praying how can you be a part of what God is doing in his church? Okay? I'm going to tell you some ways that you can be a part, in case you're curious. All right? We are going to begin a fundraising campaign as we're designing our building because this ministry center is going to cost money. For those of you who have been coming to this church, you have never heard me stand in this pulpit and ask for money. Never. But God is going to lay it on some of your hearts to give towards this ministry. It's like a seed that's planted in the ground. One may plant it, another will water it, and another will harvest it, but they all had a part in it. Folks, we're living in the last days. I'm going to continue to preach on the last days. I'm going to continue to talk about the types of things that we're seeing in the end times and the future that is going to come, and I'm telling you, the world as we know it is changing every single day. All right? When you read an article, listen to me. I read an article last week. This is the mentality and the craziness of our world. I read an, well, maybe it was a couple weeks ago. I read an article that they are petitioning in our schools. Listen to how crazy we have become to put feminine personal hygiene products in boys' bathrooms. Listen, because women are not the only ones that have a monthly cycle. <laughs> Can somebody tell me how that happens? It is a spirit of confusion, it is demonic. We have kids thinking that they're cats, and the school boards are allowing them to act like cats. It is a spirit, it is a demonic spirit trying to confuse mankind because when you don't know who you are, you will always be lost. 
but God has called churches in these last days to be churches that will speak truth, whether it goes against main culture and whether they like it or not. Because the last time I checked my Bible, Jesus said, remember this, if the world hates you, it hated me before it hated you. He said, if the world loved you, if you were of the world, it would accept you as its own. But as it is, you've been plucked out of the world. Okay? We have been plucked out of the world to stand against culture and the world to speak truth, preach truth, and allow the power of God to move in the last days and to be a part of the end time harvest before God sends his son Jesus back to this earth. And, and he has given us a phenomenal opportunity to be a part of it. I'm excited to be a part of it. Now, I'm getting ready to close because I know I've been talking for a long time. And remember, when I say I'm getting ready to close, that means nothing. <laughs> At least. <laughs> Throughout this week, because this, this has all been taking place, and we've been moving through this, and I've just seen the hand of God moving. One of the things that the Holy Spirit spoke to me is said, watch out for distractions. Because when God is moving, the enemy is always going to try and slip in and bring distractions, pull your mind away from what he has at the task at hand. He's going to try to bring division. He's going to try to bring confusion because the enemy knows that when we come together as the body of Christ and do what this, this Bible tells us that we can do, that he's going to have some problems. And listen, we can become so easily distracted and our minds can be pulled off doing things that we think you know, are important and be missing out on what God wants us to do. I was thinking this week, um, our oldest son, Drake, who's 22 years old, uh, man, it just seems like yesterday that he was just a little butterball. I used to lay him on my, on, my, on my chest, and his head would come to my chin, and his little piggies would come to about right here, and I would talk to him and pray over him and, and everything. And by the way, um, he, the, he, he is engaged, if you didn't know. Him and his are soon to be beautiful daughter-in-law, which is her birthday, by the way, today, so happy birthday. But I, I, I remember when, when I, I don't remember how old Drake was, but man, he probably was maybe a year, maybe a little bit older, and I got to put a disclaimer out before I tell this story, because uh, it's going to make me sound horrible, but w when we had a kid, you know, we completely kid-proofed our house. I mean, uh, you know, that's how, that's how parents think, right? We put all the safety things into the, uh, the, the wall sockets. You know, we put everything where nothing can be, you know, I mean, we had, we had child-proofed our house to the T. I'm always the guy that I'm looking at what can go wrong, and, and maybe let me cut it off from, from, from the tip, right, like before it even gets here. And I remember one day in our child-proof house where everything was safe and secure, my wife came to me. And she said, I'm going to take a bath, watch your son. Now, this was her fault because she said this to me as I was watching a Florida Gators football game. She should have known better than to tell me to watch our son while I'm watching a football game. And so... Drake was playing in his childproof room, everything childproof, all the corners soft, you know, the, the cushions on all the corners, everything. No way he could do anything that would bring any harm to him. And, and I could almost like see right into his bedroom. So I'm periodically keeping an eye on him, right? I'm watching the game, screaming and shouting. And at some point, I hear my wife in the bathroom, and I could tell just by the noise, she's about to come out of the bathroom. So I, I better just check real quick 
and make sure that everything's on the up and up. <laughs> and I went into our kid's childproof room, which also had a little diaper pail, where an after he used the bathroom, we would wrap the diapers up and throw it in the diaper pail. And this homeboy <laughs> opened up this diaper pail. This is, God knows I'm telling the truth, all right? Open up this diaper pail, not a number one diaper, a number two diaper, a fresh number two. And when I went in there, this boy was just, just rubbing himself down with, with a fresh one. I looked at this boy in our child-proof room, knowing my wife is about to step out of the bathroom, and this kid is covered. And I screamed out, help me, Jesus. Because I knew what was coming to me as soon as mama came out of the room. Can I get an amen from the mama hens? Right? Mama bear says, I can't, I can't leave you in charge for a minute. What's wrong with you? Is a football game more important than your son? I mean, dude. I mean, she was, she was giving me hooks, jabs, punches. But my point in this story is, is my mind was telling me, you got nothing to worry about because everything's childproof. Okay? The church can get in that frame of mind as well. To where we think because we're busy doing things, and some of those things could be godly things, but when we're doing busy things, what we're not busy is sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible, it's found in Luke chapter 10, when Jesus comes to the home of Mary and Martha. Starting at verse 38, I want to read this to you. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So you got one sister sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to Jesus. Focused on Jesus, focused on what Jesus was teaching, focused on what Jesus was pouring into her life, focused on what Jesus had for her. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. There was food that needed to be cooked. There was tea that needed to be brewed. There was bread to be baked. There was preparations for Jesus. And she was busy doing those preparations. She came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So I want to paint this picture for you in closing one sister was busy doing preparations that she thought was important, okay? We have a lot of preparations to do with moving forward. We cannot allow those preparations to take away the most important thing, which is intimacy with Jesus, sitting at his feet, listening to his voice, because you can get so distracted growing fruits and vegetables, you can get so distracted doing good things that you miss time sitting at the feet of the master. And let me tell you something. When you sit at the feet of the master, Pat, he'll tell you 
what he wants you to do. He'll speak life into you. He'll give you direction for your day. He'll give you vision. He'll give you direction for what he's wanting to do in and through you. And he's calling the church. There's a reason why intimacy with Christ is our number one core value. And everything surrounds that because he's called us to sit at his feet and listen to what he's saying. Yes, we have jobs to do for him, but don't neglect sitting at the master's feet because he said what she's doing is more important than what you're doing. Amen? Church, we have a task We have a calling. We have a vision. It's as if in the spirit realm we have a big bullseye right in front of us that says this is where we're going. We've got to count on the Holy Spirit to give us the strength. We have to sit at the feet of Jesus and let him continue to pour into us as we experience intimacy with him and listen to what he's saying. Stand with me, please. Can we bring the house lights down just a little bit, Greg? This world is rapidly changing around us. It's changing daily. And even the world that we live in right now is not going to be the world that we're living in in six months from now or a year from now. We see what's happening right before us. God has called Second Chance Church to be a lighthouse in a dark and dying world. A place where the demon possessed can come in and get set free. A place where the addicted can come in and be delivered and set free. A place where everyone will be accepted and healed and delivered. When I say everyone accepted, we're going to show them what God has for them. We're going to speak truth and show them what God has for them. The homosexual can come in and be accepted, but the homosexuality will not be accepted and will show them a better way that God has for them. The drug addict can come in and be accepted, but we will show them that God has something better for you than drugs. The depressed can come in and be accepted, but we will show them that God can heal them and deliver them and set them free and that he has something better for them. So when I say everyone is accepted, they come in one way and they encounter the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he changes them. I'm ready for it. And we're moving full steam ahead. The Holy Spirit is asking this morning, are you in? I'm not asking you because nobody answers to me. But I want to be doing kingdom work in the last days that's going to change our community and point people to the cross and to Jesus and allow their lives to be changed forever and eternally. I'm closing with this. Every week, we have our prayer team down here praying for people, anointing people with oil.
But I want the entire body this morning to take some time to pray and seek God. If you've not given God your yes, today could be your day. Today could be the day that you accept him as your Lord and your Savior. If you've already given him your yes and you've been attending this church, maybe God is asking you, how can you be a part of what he is doing in and through this local body? The church, the bride of Christ is people. It's not a building. It's people. How can we all be a part of this end times remnant church and bring this vision to pass? God doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us to glorify him. Now we're going we're gonna to do this a little bit different. I'm going to close this out with this. Listen, if you are signed up, for the Second Chance 101 class today. That class will start at 1 o'clock sharp in the clubhouse of the Country Club of Ocala. You've got the address. If you don't, it's on the sheet. It's on the papers right out front on the desk. Be there at 1. There's going to be a nice lunch buffet. It's on the church. It's not going to cost you anything. And we'll go through the Second Chance 101 class and have some fellowship. Please be there at 1 o'clock. If you didn't sign up for this one and you want to be at a class, don't worry. We'll have another one coming up. In a couple of months. But this morning as we close, I want to do it a little bit different. And I want to ask this entire body to enter in into a time of corporate prayer. That we pray individually, but corporately as a body, of how God wants to use us. When I say us, I'm talking about individually and corporately as we move into fulfilling what God has called us to do in these last days. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we come before you humbly this morning. We humble ourselves in your presence. And we give you our yes. We surrender our life to you. We surrender all that we have to you. All that we want to be, we surrender it to you. Individually and corporately as a body, we surrender ourselves to you and your lordship. God, I'm asking this morning that you would encounter each one of us individually and just begin to speak to us. God, for those that are here this morning and they don't know the giftings and the talents, the anointings that you have given them, would you just begin to reveal those? Help them to discover and to develop their giftings that you've given them. God, would you just begin to bring breakthrough in the lives of your people this morning as we seek your face. God, I speak healing over your body this morning. For those who are struggling with emotional issues, God, we speak healing over your body. For those that are struggling for, with physical issues, God, we speak healing in the mighty name of Jesus. Healing into the bodies of your people. For those who are struggling spiritually this morning, God, awaken us, awaken us, encounter us, and awaken us, Father God, in your spirit. God, help us to not be distracted, but to remain seated at your feet, listening, and ha listening to you and have an intimacy with you as you guide us and you lead us because you, Jesus, are our shepherd and we know your voice and we will not listen to another voice. 
Father, thank you for the miracles that you're performing. Thank you for uh, putting this land and giving this land to us. We continue to pray for, for favor with the city of Bellevue. Pray for favor, Lord, as we continue to move forward. And may it all be for your glory. All be for your glory and your glory alone. We are a hungry people. We're hungry for more of you. And we're hungry for an outpouring of revival. Hungry for an outpouring of your glory. Have your way in your church. Have your way in your church with your people so that we can be your hands and your feet in a lost and dying world. We give you our yes and we commit ourselves to you. Father, I pray as we leave this place this morning that you would surround us with a wall of Holy Ghost fire that the enemy would not penetrate, place a hedge of protection around us. Lord, give us wisdom according to your word. Your word says if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and that you would give it generously without finding fault. We pray for generous portions of wisdom. We pray for discernment. And we pray for you to have your way in our lives. Thank you for meeting us in your house this morning and go with us throughout this week. May we be sensitive to your Holy Spirit and hear your voice. Guide our steps, guide our speech, guide our thoughts, and have your way in our lives, we pray. In the mighty, 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 mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen.